And if you perhaps give us a steer when we're ready to roll, Sunil. All right, shall we just wait uh, for people to come for about a minute or so and then we can... Yes, if you, if you tell us, go, we go. So I wait for you. Sure, sure. Donald, just to let you know that I, I have got slides to share. Okay, uh, anyone with slides, you have the ability to share your screen. So please feel free to do so when it's your turn. Um, if that works for everyone. Anyone else have anyone else have slides? Okay. All right, we can start whenever. Are we ready? Yes, okay. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome everyone uh, to this symposium on Africa's uh, blue economy, which seeks to explore how regional cooperation of Africa's coastal and marine resources can be mobilized for a sustainable future. This symposium is proudly jointly hosted by the SOAS Economics Department, the SOAS Center for Global Finance, the Blue Economy Research Institute of the University of the Seychelles and the Royal African Society. My name is Elisava Weinberg and I am the co-head of the Economics Department. As the SOAS Economics Department, we are particularly proud to be co-hosting this event as SOAS brings together more researchers and scholars who are working on Asia and Africa than anywhere else uh, in the world. And the SOAS Economics Department itself has a keen interest in real world issues, including specifically with regard to the uh, African continent. So we would like we like to think of ourselves as a department of economics that offers an economics of and for the future, and in that context, the African continent sits center stage. Now, in a second, I will hold, uh, hand over to the heads of the co-hosting institutions, Dr. Nick Westcott, the director of the Royal African Society, Dr. Silvana Antat, the director of the Blue Economy Research Institute at the University of the Seychelles, and Professor Victor Morinde, director of the, global, uh, the Center for Global Finance, equally at SOAS. They will in turn welcome you. But before I do so, I would like to extend special thanks to our stellar panelists with us here today, as well as to Dr. Joanna Newman, who has kindly agreed to open the formal uh, session of the symposium. Dr. Joanna Newman is the Chief Executive and Secretary General of the Association of Commonwealth Universities, which itself has more than 500 member universities in over 50 countries. She's the first female Secretary General of the ACU and directs the administration of the UK government's three main international scholarships programs. These are the Chevening, Commonwealth and Marshall Scholarships. She also directs the multilateral Queen Elizabeth Commonwealth Scholarship. Now, before joining the ACU in 2017, Joanna was Vice Principal International at King's College London, where she was very instrumental in forging new international research and teaching collaborations. Joanna serves on numerous boards, including the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network's Leadership Council, the High Level Advisory Group for Mission 4.7, and acts as a lay member of the Council of Cardiff University. She is, at the same time, a senior research fellow in history at King's College London. And in 2014, Joanna was awarded an MBE in recognition of her work in promoting British higher education internationally. It's a great honor, Joanna, for having you with us today. So before I hand over uh, to uh, our co-hosts, um, I just want to let you know how we will uh, be proceeding. So our co-hosts will uh, extend their welcome to you. Then Joanna will uh, give uh, general introductory remarks uh, to the symposium, at which point I will um, introduce our moderator and the person who has been the driving force behind the symposium, uh, Donald Sparks, before I, uh, we, we get on with the panel uh, contributions themselves. So um, 
Nick Westcott, please do uh, take the Zoom floor. Thank you very much, Elisa, and uh, a warm welcome to everybody. The Royal African Society is uh, honoured to be associated with this symposium. Uh, the purpose of the society is to amplify African voices. And this is very much a neglected area where it is very important that research, policy, and opinion from the African countries themselves is badly needed. And the volume uh, that's been edited by Donald Sparks uh, is an excellent uh, survey of the whole thing. And I'm sure we'll be hearing more about it uh, later on. African oceans are a vital resource, critical to its future. And African countries and their governments uh, need to be in a position where they're able to manage, to maintain, to utilize, and to protect their marine resources, uh, the fish that swim, the coral that grows, the minerals and the oil and gas that lie beneath. My own experience over the past 20, 30 years is that many African countries are not yet in a position to do this fully. And that results in these resources being either underexploited by those countries themselves or overexploited by third parties, often with impunity. And that's why it's very urgent that this issue is addressed for all the African countries concerned and actually for the planet as a whole, as this is a, a common resource. Um, this is only one of many events that the Royal African Society uh, promotes. Uh, I won't go into any details, but I do encourage people to have a look at our website to see the full range of uh, African issues that we discuss. And uh, even better, I recommend that you join as a member so that you can get advance warning of all future events that we're holding. Uh, discounts on books, uh, including, I think this book uh, that we're discussing today, many other benefits. But I will leave it there and look forward very much to this discussion on such an important issue. Thank you. Thank you. So can I please invite Silvana? Thank you, Alisa. Um, panelists, distinguished participants. Um, I'm glad to be here and I wish to thank SOAS University of London and the Royal African Society London for giving the Blue Economy Research Institute Barry University of Seychelles the opportunity to co-host this important symposium. Barry aims to create an active academic research and knowledge network that supports an informed, fair, and sustainable economy. And part of doing that is through collaborating with local, regional, and international organizations to ensure synergies in actions, especially at local, but also regional and global level for the benefit of all. As we support the blue economy vision of sustainable development through innovation and knowledge-based approach, we are energized by and focused on the fact that we can contribute to the sustainable development of Africa through the blue economy and that collaboration does indeed maximize the use of resources. However, we do appreciate that there is obviously still a lot of work to be done and we are eager to share knowledge, develop ideas and continue this sustainable journey with our counterparts across the continent. We are looking forward to the panel experts' presentations and the discussions that follow for a better understanding of the challenges and opportunities for the African blue economy and focus on improved collaboration, which will help us be more efficient in reaching the SDGs. We continue, of course, to need strong public and private institutions, civil societies and individuals working together towards the sustainable development of Africa. And we expect that through good planning, shared visions lead to innovation for all sectors, change mindsets, shared knowledge, and developing capacity of all actors within the blue economy. So thanks to all attending today, and we look forward to you engaging with the panelists. And on behalf of Barry University of Seychelles, I hope we all take away valuable lessons from this symposium and I wish everyone a very fruitful discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Silvana. 
Um, Professor Victor Morinde, can you please welcome on behalf of the Center for Global Finance? Uh, thank you very much, Elisa, and uh, thank you very much, uh, 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 Donald, for uh, starting off this event. Uh, uh, my name is Victor Morinde, and I'm the AXA professor in global finance, and also the director of the Center for Global Finance. Uh, on behalf of the Center for Global Finance at SOAS University of London, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all uh, to this uh, uh, important event um, on the blue economy in Africa. Um, um, and indeed, when uh, 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 the team and the collaborators here started working with this event, it was super exciting to see the Center for Global Finance uh, being involved uh, because uh, within this Center for Global Finance, uh, we are interested in tracking the mega trends uh, that um, a, um, change a, uh, the uh, behavior of uh, a financial institutions and agents throughout the world, uh, and uh, which shape developments in the way financial systems work. But as we know, in a context of flow of funds, uh, whatever happens in global economies, eventually ends up uh, influencing or finding their way into the interaction between the real economy and the financial economy. And it is where uh, here that the blue economy in Africa uh, has greater implications for the financial systems uh, within the region. Um, in the Center for Global Finance, we have a number of uh, 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 projects, uh, uh, including uh, the uh, measuring and tracking developments in mega trends, uh, uh, being able to monitor and evaluate them through time. Uh, also uh, looking at uh, issues uh, uh, like inclusive finance uh, and also uh, developments uh, in financial technologies. Uh, we believe uh, that the um, focus on a blue economy of Africa uh, will change uh, um, perspective in terms of how economies can at the regional level sustain themselves uh, um, uh, um, participate in empowering uh, individuals uh, and uh, the citizens uh, in activities uh, of um, uh, uh, the blue economy, including you know, you know, fisheries, um, uh, coastal prevention, uh, sustainability, um, um, and um, this link eventually have a way of uh, getting back into the way financial systems work. Uh, um, and also importantly about how a, uh, the, both the uh, government sector and the private sector uh, work in tandem and the policies that need to be in place to ensure that uh, the blue economy uh, is uh, um, uh, uh, an area for uh, empowering uh, sustainable economic development uh, in the region. It's in that context that uh, uh, we uh, welcome you here, and uh, we hope that uh, this deliberation will give us new insights of our research that will extend uh, uh, into many areas, uh, you know, economics, uh, finance, and development, uh, but also will empower the other stakeholders whom we often forget, like uh, civil society and uh, the private sector. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Victor, and for reminding us of the core role of the connections between the blue economy and the financial systems across uh, countries and in particular for the region. So, so with that, could I please invite Joanna to formally open uh, our discussions uh, today? Thank you so much, Elisa, and it's an absolute pleasure to open this symposium. And I'm pleased to see so many registrants uh, from around the world uh, on the participants list. And unfortunately, we can't all be together in person, but uh, the digital world does actually help us engage globally. I'd first like to thank the co-hosts, uh, SOAS, University of London, the Royal African Society and the University of Seychelles for their support. And I'd also like to thank our distinguished panellists for joining us today. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said the 21 Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report was a code red for, for humanity. The alarm bells are deafening and the evidence is irrefutable. And it's clear to all that the planet is in the cri climate crisis. But what is less well known is that it is also an ocean crisis. In particular, Africa faces devastating consequences if it does not implement sustainable blue economic policies very soon. 
When we see clear cutting of forests or strip mining of large areas, most of us want a call to action. Many of us feel that these activities are not sustainable and support policies and activities to restrict them. Unfortunately, equally disturbing practices take place in the deep seas and most of us are not even aware of them. For example, more than half of all key marine biodiversity areas are not protected. Ocean dead zones, areas that lack enough oxygen to support marine life, are rising at an alarming rate from 400 in 2008 to some 700 in 2019. And less than 2% of national research budgets are allocated for marine science. Africa is losing precious mangrove areas, which are vital for marine nurseries. The cold Benguela current that flows along the southwest African coast from South Africa to Angola provides essential nutrients for fish production in these countries. Should that current warm up due to climate change, the fishing industry in South Africa, Namibia and Angola will be in jeopardy. Illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing is all too common and most countries in Africa find it hard to enforce their maritime laws. Until recently, the world's coastal and marine areas have been thought of as limitless resources and places to store our waste. The results have ranged from degraded coastal habitats, marine pollution, negative impacts from man-made climate change and overfishing. According to the UN Food and Agricultural Organization, some 57% of the world's fish stocks are fully exploited and another 30% are overexploited. This is important as marine fisheries generally contribute some 270 billion US dollars annually to the world economy. Clearly, our current uses of the blue economy are not sustainable. Of the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals, goal number 14, life below water, is the least funded. Only 0.1% of official development assistance is directed towards SDGs, uh, that is directed towards SDGs goes towards that goal. And even private investment and funding from philanthropic organizations comes in at just over half of 1% of SDG funding from these sources, grossly inadequate to meet Africa's blue economy needs. It is vital that the international community face up to the code red challenges of Africa's blue economy to scale up the flow of finance towards this challenge and the rollout of innovative finding methods uh, financing mechanisms as bl such blue bonds were appropriate. The blue economy movement was strengthened by the African Union's adoption of the 2050 Africa Integrated Maritime Strategy in 2012 um, and it's being taken forward through the AU's Africa Blue Economy Strategy adopted in 2020. Indeed the African Union has correctly called the blue economy the new frontier of the African Renaissance. This is key as 38 nations in Africa have coasts, 12 of which are members of our Commonwealth. Maritime zones under African jurisdiction total over 10 million square kilometers with vast potential for offshore and deep sea mineral exploitation. And some 90% of the region's trade is conducted by sea. Clearly coastal and marine resources will play essential roles as a source for food, energy and economic development for the foreseeable future. In 2018, our Chogham, our Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting, agreed that the Commonwealth Blue Charter, which brings countries together to find solutions to the biggest ocean challenges, 16 countries have stepped forward to lead action groups across 10 areas of sustainable ocean development and conservation, with 46 countries having joined one or more of these action groups. Kenya led the Blue Charter Action Group on a sustainable blue economy, again highlighting the African momentum on this movement. Across the Commonwealth, organisations such as my own at the Association of Commonwealth Universities are supporting with this commitment. We believe that through international collaboration, we can find solutions to shared global challenges. And we're pleased to be working with our diverse network of universities and governments uh, to drive forward the aims of the Blue Charter. Our Blue Charter Fellowships supported 38 researchers, including 16 from Africa, to translate science into cutting edge solutions to reduce marine plastics pollution and strengthen collaboration and develop an ecosystem of academics and universities working in partnership to forward marine sustainability across the Commonwealth. The forthcoming uh, Heads of Government meeting in Kigali in Rwanda this June will provide an opportunity to renew our commitment to the Blue Charter and take its impact to the next level. 
The blue economy shows much promise, including finding ways to pursue a low carbon, a low carbon path of economic development that would include creating employment opportunities and reducing poverty. Indeed, the World Bank believes that blue growth or environmentally sustainable economic growth based on the oceans is a strategy of sustaining economic growth and job creation necessary to reduce poverty in the face of worsening resource constraints and climate crisis. Given the high stakes, it is essential that Africa's blue economy policies and goals be expanded. Just as sustainable development green initiatives show promise, so too could blue economy projects and activities. It's imperative that all states adopt strategies to achieve enhanced wealth and well-being from the oceans in the coming years. Whether blue economy outcomes will live up to their promise is another matter. There is little doubt that short-term gains will be made from including from, for example, increased aquaculture and advances in fishing technologies. Yet the long-term sustainability of these endeavors will require concerted effort and significant political will. Finally, as many of the challenges such as marine pollution or maritime security respects no borders, African countries will have to find more ways to boost cooperation and collaboration regionally and globally to find solutions. And this, I think this event is, is, uh, is testimony to that. We believe that research and education have a vital role to play in supporting practical action and progress on the blue economy, and that international collaboration will be central to realizing this transition. We're pleased to be working with partners, including the Commonwealth Secretariat, on the development of a centre of excellence for the blue economy in the Eastern Caribbean, in Antigua. And we hope that that will provide opportunities for new partnerships and the translation of research-led solutions beyond the Caribbean, across the Commonwealth and the globe. I'm confident that this symposium on Africa's blue economy will provide new and innovative ways about looking at Africa's blue economy and how to change code red to code blue. Again, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to provide these remarks, and I look forward to a lively discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Joanna, in particular for reminding us of the urgency of the issues against the code red backdrop, but also highlighting that there might be lots of opportunities to turn that towards blue. Um, that leaves me then to introduce the moderator of our panel discussion, uh, Dr. Donald Sparks. Uh, he has been the driving force behind the organization of our symposium uh, here today. Uh, Donald is currently a visiting Fulbright professor in the economics department at SOAS, and he is also an emeritus professor of international economics at uh, the Citadel in uh, Charleston. He is also a visiting professor of international economics at the management center uh, in Innsbruck, uh, Austria. He serves on the Economics and Local Economy Specialist Group of the International Union for Conservation of Nature's Commission on Environmental, Economic and Social uh, Policy. Donald has been a Fulbright Professor at the University of Swaziland, previously the University of Maribor, the African Union Commission's Department of Economic Affairs in Addis and at the National University of Laos. At the American University in Cairo, he was the department chairman and visiting professor of economics for a year. Before he entered academia, Donald Spark served as a foreign service officer in the Office of Economic Analysis at the US Department of State and as a staff assistant to Senator Ernst Hollings. Donald was a senior consultant associate at the US Department of State during the Obama administration. He is also a proud alumnus of SOAS, where he came to do his MA and PhD, and he has a bachelor's degree from George Washington University. The floor is yours, Donald. Elisa, thank you very much for the kind introduction. And I'm delighted that we have such a distinguished panel with us today representing academia, uh, elected officials and policymakers. Before I introduce the panelists, I would like to first thank Dr. Newman for her insightful comments she made about the code red and the importance and urgency of the focus on Africa's blue economy. I'd also like to thank the three hosting institutions, uh, SOAS, University of Seychelles, and the Royal African Society. I've been a member for three decades, I believe. Um, for panel members, I'll ask you to please limit your remarks, your initial remarks to 15 minutes. Uh, and for participants, if you have questions, which I'm sure you will, please put them in the Q&A box. We have, I think, over 400 registrars, so I doubt we'll get to all your questions today. 
It would be a very long day if we did, but I welcome as many as we can. Um, we'll begin in this order, uh, Dr. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Uh, Jean-Francois Ferrari, minister, followed by Dr. Uh, Louis-René LaRose-Peter, Francis Moyanda, and ending with Nicholas Harbin montfort I'll give a brief introductory uh, introduction for each of the panel members, very brief, because the full bio will be uh, noted on the right-hand side of your uh, chat box. First with uh, Minister for Fisheries and Blue Economy for Seychelles is Jean-Francois Ferrari. Um, he is a founding member of the party Selwa, the largest political party in Seychelles, and was elected in 2007 to the National Assembly. He earned his bachelor's degree in sociology and a master's in education uh, science at University of Provence. And between 1960, excuse me, 1993 and 2013, Minister Ferrari was the publisher and assistant editor of Regard newspaper, a weekly publication in Seychelles. He's a great uh, interest in law, philosophy, and politics, and we're honored to have him today. He'll be our first speaker, followed by another Seychelles law, Dr. Louis Rene LaRose Peter, also from Seychelles. He is an international uh, consultant for the World Bank Group right now. And also he is uh, at, a member of the Center for Global Finance here at SOAS. He's former Minister of Finance, Trade and Economic Planning of the Seychelles, assumed his position in 2016 after leaving his term at the World Bank, where he served as two years as a executive director. He brings a wealth of experience from both the public and private sectors, including knowledge of central banking, as he was also the general manager of the Central Bank of Seychelles. He'll be followed by Francis Moyande, a fellow Fulbright scholar. Uh, he was at the University of Arkansas. <clears throat> He's a senior lecturer of public policy uh, and social sciences at Mzumbe University in Tanzania. Francis has been a principal investigator of a variety of research projects to engage in numerous forums, including the Six Indian Ocean Dialogue of the Indian Ocean Rim Association, um, he has an impressive research record, including a number of publications on public policy analysis in the African context. And he wrote a chapter in the book that Nick Westcott referenced, my edited volume on the uh, blue economy in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And last but not least is Dr. Nicholas Hardman Montfort, head of oceans and natural resources at the Commonwealth Secretariat here in London, where he leads a technical team delivering the Commonwealth Blue Charter Initiative the Commonwealth Sustainable Energy Transition Agenda, and technical assistance projects on ocean governance and natural resources reform in the Commonwealth countries. Nick's a diplomat and a marine scientist working in science, climate, <clears throat> science, climate and resource governance, multilateral uh, development, with a strong focus on sustainable blue economies. With 25 years research experience, taking him to the Indian Ocean, Pacific and the Southern Oceans, Atlantic Ocean, with a variety of uh, research projects. He is also an uh, adjunct professor uh, at the University of Western Australia, and he's published over 150 uh, publications, including book chapters, articles, et cetera, including also a chapter in my recent book on the blue economy. So as a very uh, distinguished uh, panelist we have today, I look forward to your remarks. Uh, Minister Ferrari, could I ask you please to begin? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sparks. I, uh, I'd like, first of all, to, to uh, tell you how uh, privileged I feel that, uh, to have been invited to, to participate in this, uh, in this uh, symposium. I, uh, I noticed that I'm uh, the only politician in the room. And, uh, I, uh, and for that, I, I would like to share with you some interesting facts about uh, the development of the blue economy in the Seychelles. Now, I, you might be uh, surprised. I don't have a prepared text because in my mind, I'd like to share the successes of, uh, of the work that we have been doing in Seychelles in, uh, for the past uh, 10, 15 years. And I commend my predecessors and uh, uh, Dr. Laos, who is in, uh, in uh, uh, who is with us today has been one of those precursors who has uh, believed in uh, in uh, development of the blue economy. So I am just uh, I am not a trailblazer, but I am uh, some one of uh, those uh, uh, politicians who has uh, also uh, believed and uh, is now uh, 
pushing the blue economy agenda as, uh, as far as I can. Now, let me tell you a little bit about the, about the Seychelles. You know, um, uh, uh, when we talk of uh, the world's landmass, we, talk, we, we see uh, uh, landmass is 30% and uh, the seascape is 70%. Now, I'd like to tell you, for those who, who do not know, um, uh, in Seychelles, 99.6% of, uh, of our country is ocean, and only 0.4% is, uh, is, is a landmass. Now you can you can imagine when you uh, when you 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 picture this in your mind that uh, that the only way we can grow the only way the only direction where we can develop is is uh, outwards to the ocean. So uh, we've realized that uh, for for many years, and this is why uh, I am uh, uh, in the cabinet of ministers in the government of Seychelles what uh, you would term as the first amongst the ministers. The president of Seychelles wanted, when he formed his first cabinet, to give uh, a very, very prominent uh, place to the development of the blue economy. So he chose his most senior minister to head this, uh, th this portfolio. But he also gave, uh, his, his, uh, he gave, he also gave me a challenge to balance the development of the blue economy with the development of the fisheries industry, which uh, we uh, we uh, um, uh, hope to develop to become the second pillar of the economy. So you can see from the start how what a difficult balancing act I have to do to uh, to uh, to develop the the ocean economy and to protect it at the same time. But I like this challenge, and I'd like to tell you that uh, that over the, those past few years, we have done, I would say, pretty well in, 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 char in chartering a way forward. We, we are in many ways pioneers of, uh, of uh, the blue economy financing because we realized from, from day one that although there, there's never been so much money on the table for, for blue, the blue economy development, it has never been so hard to access uh, those finances because of the rules that are imposed by lending organizations uh, that are imposed by, by NGOs or all other organizations who, by the way, with respect to all of you, who claim to be, uh, to be uh, advocates and, 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 and supporters of the blue economy, but who often who often are part of a system which makes it very difficult for us to expand into the blue economy. So what have we done in Seychelles? Now, in order to achieve uh, this very delicate balance between development and conservation, and in order to give ourselves uh, a chance to succeed in protecting our ocean space, because we, we, we are very conscious of the need to to uh, to conserve and protect our ocean space because you will you you will know that our first industry is tourism. Now, between fisheries and tourism, between uh, uh, hydrocarbon research and tourism, there there, there 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 are some very slippery slopes there. So Seychelles has had to develop some some very uh, some some innovative and strategic planning tools as well as uh, financing tools. Which we are proud uh, to share with uh, with the rest of uh, of the world. And I say that because uh, I'd like to remind you. I said earlier that it is difficult to raise finance, and and sometimes when we succeed in raising finance for our projects, we find it difficult to 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 uh, to allocate those finance to to specific projects because of of, of bureaucratic and and uh, and. Uh, and other, other difficulties. Now, amongst those strategic planning tools and innovative uh, financing tools, I'd like to, I'd like to say that uh, earlier on in our development, we, we realized that we needed a, a blue economy framework and we needed a, a blue economy roadmap. 
so that it could give us an, uh, a, a really a very clear policy document so that, 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 we, can, uh, that we can convince the world and, and our partners to, uh, to, to stand by us. And this was, uh, this was uh, formulated uh, and, and officialized two years ago through the technical assistance of the Commonwealth Secretariat. So, so it is only fitting at this point that I, 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 uh, I, I say thank you to the Commonwealth I see that the blue charter is in the, is in the room, and uh, and the universities are in the room. So thank you so much for for being our partner in uh, in mapping out those uh, this framework and and roadmap. Now, another example which uh, which I think uh, it is important that other countries uh, um, uh, take take serious note of is uh, we embarked uh, with uh, with other partners on on. Uh, the Seychelles Marine Special Plan, special plan uh, which for us is, is a strategic governance tool. And uh, we, uh, we, we, we did this in partnership with the, uh, the Nature Conservancy uh, and the Seychelles uh, UNDP uh, GEF uh, Program Coordinating Unit. We work with the, with the European Union and, uh, and uh, we work very hard on this MSP and uh, and uh, and this allowed us to restructure our debt, Mr. Larose. Again, Professor Larose, you will uh, you will have been very instrumental in uh, in uh, in, the design, in designing those tools. And uh, and we uh, it was a very important tool because it allowed allowed us at a very difficult time in our economy to restructure our national debt in exchange for designating thirty percent of our EEZ as marine protected areas. So I'm just, I, I, I uh, it's been a long, it's been long haul. It's been, it's been difficult negotiations, hard work, but, but I, I believe that unless we have those kind of tools, we don't, we don't move forward. Now, uh, uh, then uh, we also needed a monitoring and evaluation framework. It is, it is absolutely important because, uh, because each time we, uh, we, uh, we we come up with a program or with a with a project. We are asked how are we going to evaluate and how are we going to monitor and how are we going to feedback to the donors uh, on uh, and implementing and making sure that the implementing agents uh, are tracking and assessing the achievements uh, that we have set out. So uh, the blue economy monitoring and evaluation framework is key, is key, and I'd like to tell everyone. If you don't have it, then you 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 need to you need to to work towards it because this is what is going to help you to raise some some finance for some uh, interesting projects. Uh, finally, I won't uh, I, I won't bore you too much with uh, those uh, finance tools and technical tools, but I'd like to to uh, to to tell you that in 2018, Seychelles launched uh, its first sovereign blue bond, which is also very innovative. And uh, and uh, and uh, it is designed. Those bonds are designed to to support sustainable marine fisheries. And uh, so the and the proceeds from the bonds have been used in supporting expansion of marine protected areas. So all is interlinked. Now I'll 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 I'll, I'll just move on a little bit to to tell you that despite those tools and despite having being one of the countries that have been the most successful in, in pushing our, uh, uh, into the new frontier, we have some challenges. And, uh, and uh, these challenges, the, the first one is the fact that Seychelles is a high income uh, country now. It's, it's the only one, or maybe the second one in Africa, high income country, and nobody wants to hang around with us anymore because, because we, are, we are supposed to be, we're supposed to be okay. We're supposed to know what to do, and we're supposed to have all the means. Uh, to, well, it's wrong. It's wrong. It's it's wrong to think like that. It's uh, it's wrong to 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 allow us to to swim on our own because uh, we uh, we are on the on the road to to becoming a, a a success story, and and we need to be accompanied to the uh, to uh, to the end of our e efforts. So and and. Uh, I, I just like to say that the difficulties and the challenges that we face are not challenges that we that we uh, have brought upon ourselves. 
uh, there are challenges that we inherit from the rest of the world and especially from the developed world. I mean, when, when we talk of overfishing in Seychelles, it's not us who are overfishing. We don't have the capacity to overfish. When we talk of illegal fishing, unreported, unregulated fishing, it's not us doing it. It's, it's, it's the bigger countries uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, sometimes even the European Union countries who, uh, who are present in the, <coughs> in the uh, Indian Ocean, but also larger countries such as India, Pakistan, Oman, and countries like that. So, so we are small. And yet we have, we have to, to face those very big challenges. We have, uh, we have uh, not spent enough time and, and, and money. We, we have some research, but uh, and thank, thank, thankfully for that, on, uh, on, uh, on finding, uh, on deepening our research in, uh, on matters of uh, coral bleaching and, and, uh, and uh, ocean uh, um, temperature rise and global warming. And we need now to mitigate the, the adverse effects of those uh, phenomena. So we will be turning again to, uh, to, to the financing agencies to help us save our mangroves uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and pick up marine debris, pick, us, pick up plastic pollution, not from our side. When I go to the islands in Seychelles and I go, I go do some beach cleaning, the, the, the flip-flops and, and, and the and the plastic water bottles, the pet bottles that I pick up, don't come from Seychelles. They come from the from the other side of the world, as far as the, as the Atlantic. So we have those very very big challenges to keep our our space clean for tourism, uh, um, clean and sustainable for our, our our fishing industry. But all these costs. When you tell us, and I will I will I will end on this point. When we are congratulated for having reached 30, 30 in 2022. We have designated 30% of our ocean space to uh, uh, as protected areas. I just like to tell the world, we need to, we need to manage those areas. It's okay to, de to designate them, but if we can't manage them, it's useless. We're wasting our time. So, so the effort is, is a continued effort and and it's uh, it, it it doesn't stop at uh, at at our stage of development, but it should continue. And and I I I, I would like to thank all of you who advocate <clears throat> for small island states like ourselves, and who recognize the important contribution that we are we are trying to make to pro to 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 protect and preserve the ocean. And I can tell you, we are. We are grateful for whatever you do for us, but uh, we still need, uh, we are <clears throat> in the middle of the ocean, we are like orphans and we need, we, need the, we need the bigger human world international family to accompany us in those efforts that we are, that we are, are doing. So I thank you for, for advocating in our favor and understanding the challenges that we face. Thank you. Mr. Fry, thank you very much for your um, very balanced uh, remarks where you discuss the, the successes and challenges facing Seychelles. And I might note that I was struck by your comment about Seychelles being the victim in a way of, of pollution and other um, you know, adverse conditions, cl climate change being other, others that they didn't really contribute much to. And this is indicative of much of the developing world and certainly most of of Africa is this way. They really didn't contribute that much to global warming, for example, yet they are suffering as much, if not more than anywhere else on, the, on earth. And I was also struck by the Seychelles leadership, not only just in, in the Indian Ocean region and, and, and Africa, but worldwide, you have done a remarkable job of protecting marine coastal uh, areas, cooperating with uh, your neighbor Mauritius, um, being a member of the Fisheries Transparency Initiative, a charter member of this yeah, yeah. initiative. So uh, Seychelles is really a very small place with a big punch. So thank you for your comments. I'm sure there'll be some questions for you later. Uh, yeah. Next we'll ask- Let me, oh, let me just tell you this. I, I think it'll, it'll be of interest. And, and yet we are, we are trying projects that are beyond our size. You know that with Mauritius, we have uh, embarked on a joint management of, uh, of the, the uh, Saya de Mala Plateau, which is, uh, which is beyond our, our EZ. And to protect 
to protect uh, grass meadows the size of Switzerland. We want to protect those meadows because we know how important they are. it is as carbon sinks. Uh, and, but we really, we are fighting, uh, we are punching way, way, way above our, our weight. And, uh, and uh, we, need to, we need the whole world to partner with us uh, be, uh, because we really believe in what we're doing. And, uh, and with your help, we can, we can succeed. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll ask now for a uh, fellow of uh, uh Dr. Peter Rose, would you please take the floor? Thank you so much, uh, John. And uh, of course, uh, from the outset, I would like to thank uh, Honorable Minister uh, Jean-Francois Ferrari for his very rich uh, introduction and remarks about me. Yes, indeed, I contributed a lot in the development of Seychelles, and still there are more to be contributed. So never feel uh, shy uh, to keep me outside the loop because I'm ever ready uh, to carry the flags of the beautiful Seychelles. Uh, of course, uh, when I look at uh, the opportunities and challenges, I want to start with uh, some simple economic uh, terms. Nothing complicated at this uh, juncture. Uh, for example, the opportunities for us. What is this blue economy? It is a vast economic sector, perhaps the largest sector of a tourism development. And of course, as the Honorable Minister spoke eloquently, uh, he is really overseeing the gold mine of Seychelles. We might not see it uh, right away, but it's coming up. If we are prepared to put our minds, our heads uh, together and our efforts, we can make it a gold mine. It's not the first time I repeat about uh, the low economy as a gold uh, mine. And of course, I'm very passionate and uh, very convinced that it's going to happen in the future. We just need some uh, determined people to come together and uh, bring up uh, the uh, philosophical uh, drive that will uh, achieve uh, this uh, uh, overall um, uh, economic uh, outcome. Uh, of course, it's a vast ocean and uh, it provides a lot of uh, fisheries uh, with uh, income for local, uh, uh, the local um, uh, sector and international sector. So all these sectors depends on Seychelles. It's not something that we are too small. We are never too small until we find it impossible. Uh, Seychelles is there. And of course, most of the time we forget about the contribution that Seychelles does to our own respective cash box as a former uh, uh, policy maker. And of course, I've realized that uh, this is something that uh, we have to make sure that it happens over a certain period of time frame. Uh, this uh, time frame cannot be too long. It must be short term. We have to start uh, with a short term summer. And in the end, we will uh, certainly surmount to achieve the main objectives of Seychelles. Uh, it provides employment and a vast amount of income to local and international communities. Sometimes this is what the international communities forget that Seychelles can be the bread, the bread, uh, bread baskets uh, for a simple reason is that once uh, they've uh, gathered the uh, maximum revenue and return, they forget about this little island called Seychelles. And to many other uh, business entrepreneurs, it can be turned into a cash cow of, for any country if it is efficiently exploited with other sectors. You know, the blue economy uh, certainly is an economic sector, but it does not stand on its own. It is integrated with other sectors and we have to make it work. We have to make uh, this uh, scientific and strategic analysis to make sure where do we derive maximum revenue. 
And uh, of course, it provides scope for major collaboration uh, with uh, neighboring countries, greater scope for additional services. One important uh, challenge is that uh, we face, of course, we tend to say that we are small, but I don't believe that. Small doesn't mean anything. And in fact, if we look at the, the uh, I'm sorry to digress a little bit, if we look at America, America is not uh, the, the largest uh, uh, countries in the world, but it's certainly outreach to planet Mars, which is much bigger than what we are. So we can only say that uh, we are limited when we find it, it's unlimited. One uh, major issue is with regards to the constraints, which I would like to highlight. You know, the uh, advantages would always work in our, our best advantages, as long as we monitor and we uh, surveillance the changing uh, environment uh, to make sure that we are on the right track. It's a uh, avoid the geopolitical risk. Hence, I commend the Pan-African setup for this type of uh, business enterprise. The Pan-African setup will certainly drive out the greedy people, the greedy entrepreneurs out of our system because uh, surely we want to generate the bigger amount of kicks. And of course, as we are calling on our fellow members are uh, Africans, uh, we need their support. And uh, we, we seem as a small country to have the benefit of the advantages of being very, very small. We've done so many things that other countries fail to achieve. So we can't put it aside and say, oh, uh, let's uh, put it aside. We've achieved what we've achieved. No, there's more to be achieved. And I'm convinced we don't have a minister there are at the head who is a very passionate developer and he speaks very frankly. And then he takes the advantage of Seychelles and other African countries very seriously. So he is a man that we can certainly follow his lead. And I am one of them who would be prepared to assist Honorable Minister in whatever venture, in whatever demarche he uh, is about to find out. At least another Seychellois would be there uh, and ready for it, you know. So, uh, you know, the, uh, being a vast ocean, especially when we talk of all about the other countries, African countries. So we need to consider ourselves to be very critical about economic, social, and political exploitation. Uh, sometimes, as I said, the geopolitics can play a lot of damage. And then by the time we realize it, it's already too far. You know, uh, some of the biggest uh, uh, entrepreneurs, they are there to destroy, not to construct. It requires, in terms of finance, a large amount of capital. And this capital cannot be generated from Africa alone. So there must be uh, an amount uh, raised externally with the collaboration of external parties. Yeah, uh, certainly I looked at uh, the presentation where they mentioned about IDA. You know, Seychelles being small, what is it for IDA? IDA is an international development association. And, and I used to be an executive director for this uh, organization. I always argue that uh, Seychelles deserve more than it benefits from this either. It's high time, and I'm sure uh, Honorable Minister Ferrari will join me at a certain, a certain point in time to make his uh, voice known to the international community. It's no time to joke. It's time to act seriously and seriously. Uh, certainly on uh, the maximum exposure, should be elevated. So at least it provides us adequate finance that will uh, help uh, other, other sectors because we cannot certainly talk about development using chicken uh, uh, feed uh, financing 
uh, if we are going to raise uh, five million dollars, and then uh, of course they ask for 15 million, 20 million. Talking about the blue bond, I was a minister who signed on 2018, just before I departed the government on the blue bond. It was not easy, but I was convinced it can be done. And I'm really glad that uh, Honorable Minister Ferrari acknowledged that today, that it was all secretly kept on the carpet. In my own little way, I worked so hard for this country. Um, I realize that I've spoken quite a lot and I do re uh, respect the time allotted uh, to me. And I will uh, certainly uh, give my uh, final comments that the resources are there, but you need capable people to find where these resources are and how can it be raised. We should not be scared of amounts. We should be scared if our ventures will turn successful. And we have to make it successful. Honorable Minister Ferrari and our distinguished uh, panel, thank you so much for allowing me the space to share with you today. Uh, I think there are opportunities that we can uh, have a greater uh, platform. So at least we can uh, iron out all our little problems. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. All the very best to other participants. Dr. LaRose, thank you very much for your contributions. You speak with uh, tremendous authority, having been the uh, biggest proponent for replenishing the uh, IDA round, which gave, I think, $93 billion, didn't give, but uh, provided $93 billion for development purposes under your, uh, under your leadership. So you know, what you're, you know what you're talking about. And I was struck by your, your philosophy about uh, it's never too small to do the right thing. That's what I got from your, your presentation in Seychelles again, being one of the smallest nations, not only in Africa, but, but in the world is never too small to do the right thing. And a um, good example of localized financing with the Blue Bond Initiative as opposed to looking for a more global source of financing. And a few questions have come in about the uh, focus perhaps being too much on global financing where I think this is a good example of local financing with your Blue Bond Initiative. So thank you very much for that. We'll ask now uh, Francis Moriande. Francis, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sparks. Uh, can I have the screen to share? I have a slide to, to share with you. If you go down to your bottom of your screen, you'll see screen share, the green box, the very bottom, and you should press that and you should, be, you should get to your screen. Okay, are you able to see, I hope. Right, so um, thank you very much. And uh, I really feel honored uh, to be inv invited uh, to this uh, uh, symposium. Um, I would like uh, to uh, give uh, my presentation titled uh, Blue Economy, Regional Cooperation for Sustainable Future, which was uh, the main theme but the focus is uh, on Tanzania. Um, I've also uh, wanted to introduce to you uh, the uh, Permanent Secretary uh, Abud Jumbe, uh, Ministry of Blue Economy and the Fisheries uh, there uh, in Zanzibar, uh, and also the Captain uh, and Dr. Hamad Bakar, who is uh, the Director uh, from the Ministry of Blue Economy um, and the Fisheries uh, in the government. Um, in this uh, uh, presentation, I hope it is moving, it's not moving. Okay, let me just go ahead. Um, in this presentation, what we have prepared is uh, the, uh, the Blue Economy uh, in, uh, in Tanzania. And uh, what we are giving you is uh, the opportunities um, and the challenges as uh, the, uh, the focus of uh, uh, the, this uh, symposium. Uh, nevertheless, uh, it's important to know the geo, geo uh, location of, uh, of Tanzania. 
uh, you would realize that uh, Tanzania is uh, bordering the uh, Indian Ocean, and we have the stretch of uh, over 1,400 uh, kilometers along the uh, Indian Ocean. And uh, that alone uh, gives the sense that uh, uh, we have the potential, uh, and this is the unleashed potential for blue economy uh, in Tanzania. Um, as I said, um, I'm honored to be accompanied by uh, uh, the Ministry of Blue Economy and the Fisheries in Zanzibar. Uh, Zanzibar uh, is surrounded by uh, waters, and you see it's the Indian Ocean. So seashores, as you were talking, possibly there are a lot of commonality that uh, we share uh, uh, seashores uh, with the uh, Zanzibar. Um, but uh, the challenges uh, possibly could be uh, similar or different. Now, what we are presenting to you uh, is uh, what are the potential areas that uh, blue economy uh, uh, could uh, could be uh, taken forward under the regional cooperation uh, for sustainable future of of Tanzania. Um, in um, the study uh, that uh, I conducted, which was part of my chapter in a uh, Sparks uh, um, uh, book, uh, you would realize that uh, uh, there are uh, potential sectors. Uh, we have the uh, the marine. Uh, transportation and uh, that goes without say that uh, uh, there are ports and uh, in Tanzania we have the Tanzania uh, Port Authority. Uh, we have for also the potential for uh, industries and this comes from the Ministry of uh, um, Industries and uh, this one uh, could be the industries for fisheries, uh, industries for, for, for uh, making ships, uh, but we have also industry for uh, natural gas. Uh, Tanzania has a potential of uh, natural gas, uh, which we are um, explore, explored um, uh, recently, and that has also not been explored to the uh, to the maximum to benefit the uh, the economy. Uh, we have the another potential, uh, the tourism industry. The tourism industry. Uh, that would use uh, the water resources, the marine resources, uh, all along with the beaches, they said with a stretch of uh, over uh, 1,400 uh, kilometers along this, uh, that is also an uh, uh, exploited uh, potential. Now, all these possibly uh, cannot happen without uh, the enabling environment. So what we are looking is uh, uh, the challenges. The challenge is uh, on the enabling uh, environment. When we talk of enabling environment, we are really referring to the policy process that uh, unless there is a buy-in from the government that would uh, put in place a policy for exploiting uh, the marine resources, the blue economy resources, that would not happen. So uh, the uh, um, Tanzania government are uh, emanating from what we, we had in the uh, 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 political part election uh, manifestos. And in this case, possibly I'm referring to the current ruling party, the CCM, that they had um, the one of the agenda uh, in their election manifesto was uh, development of blue economy. Um, and uh, it was from there that uh, the government of uh, Zanzibar have already developed uh, the blue economy uh, policy. And in fact, they established, uh, we, have est we have established um, a full-fledged ministry is called the Ministry of Blue Economy and Fisheries. So that shows uh, the, 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 the government buy-in for uh, developing uh, uh, blue economy. Uh, sorry, my slides are not moving. So I, instead of wash, uh, wasting my time, I decided just to go ahead without my slides. Um, now, 
Based on that uh, uh, policy, uh, there is a framework that uh, uh, the government is uh, 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 developing. And that means the implementation of uh, the blue economy uh, in Tanzania. And that cuts across uh, the, um, the, the sectors that are involved. And uh, these uh, includes the Ministry, Ministry of uh, um, uh, Industries, Ministry of uh, Livestock and Fisheries, uh, Ministry of Transport, as we have Marine Transport, and um, we have also Ministry of Tourism. That would, uh, uh, so as we are talking about cooperation at a national level, what is needed is the potential. One is uh, the, uh, the government buy-in, then two is the coordination across sectors. As we're saying, these sectors that I just mentioned, but uh, cooperation would not uh, be enough. The, we need more corporations. We know for sure that we have the strong and for sure uh, saying we need a cooperation with uh, all the members along the uh, uh, Ayora. But we need to go and explore what the African Union has put as a strategy. African Union strategy for blue economy uh, specify that what we have for all the uh, opportunities uh, for uh, EPA, the um, European um, market, but we have also the Chinese markets, but also we have within the African countries that we could cooperate uh, within uh, the, the, the African Union uh, partnership. So what are the challenges? The challenges really are lying on the capacity, the human and resource capacity, the financing, um, the financing of blue economy um, in for, for the uh, industrialization, the financing for human capacity on research. I come from Mzumba University, which is a research academia. Uh, we need to create the capacity for linkages between um, uh, academia research and uh, the industry. The industry is on the uh, blue economy, where there is a real low link as, as we speak. Uh, we need to build the capacity. Now in Tanzania, uh, we try to establish uh, at, um, the, uh, the chapter for IORA uh, on academic group, but we couldn't go ahead because we have lack of resources to promote the uh, academia and research industry uh, linkages. So we need the resources for this. Uh, more than that, the cooperation that uh, is likely to happen is only when we have uh, uh, the, 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 I should say, the high level government uh, platforms that would buy in uh, the blue economy to make uh, an implementation of the African Union agenda. And uh, so to speak, what we are suggesting from uh, this end is uh, to promote uh, the African Union blue economy uh, agenda, because uh, no single country can go along with this agenda uh, singly. So we need to go along with that. And that cooperation we should not isolate Africa, should link with other countries that are in the world promoting the blue economy. Having said this, we uh, would uh, like to uh, uh, end up here, but I will welcome our comments and questions uh, as my colleagues uh, from uh, the Ministry of uh, uh, Blue Economy uh, and Fisheries in Zanzibar, I believe they were able to join. They could also contribute later. Thank you so much. Francis, thank you very much for your comments, uh, focusing on Tanzania. Particularly, I was struck by your call for this interdisciplinary approach and noting that no single country can go it alone and you must have, um, must have cooperation. And I believe that leads us well into our next speaker, uh, Dr. Nicholas Harvey-Munford, who specializes in 
country cooperation, particularly with this char blue, <coughs> blue charter. So, uh, Dick, the floor is yours. Thank you, Donald. Uh, thank you very much. And I uh, want to acknowledge all the other speakers, um, uh, Honourable Minister, former Minister and, and distinguished colleagues, um, all courtesies observed. Um, I um, do have a few slides to share, so if you just bear with me while I um, share those. Um, and then I will go to the full presentation mode. Uh, and you should be able to see that, so that's great. Okay, um, can you see those? Okay, Donald. Brilliant, fantastic. Okay, so um, I wanna take a slightly different tack to the blue economy today. Um, and um, first of all, say it's a real privilege to be here speaking um, at this symposium, um, and, and, and the title is, is really grabbed me to this, Regional Cooperation for a Sustainable Future, because an organization that promotes cooperation between member states as, as, as a way of achieving sustainable development, uh, that really resonated. Um, a colleague of mine in Kenya, David Abura, who's an internationally renowned coral reef scientist and conservation scientist, um, has recently been writing about the importance of narratives in direction setting um, and um, for, for outcomes in conservation and blue economy and so on. And I want to share with you today a different narrative to the one that often prevails on the blue economy, <clears throat> which is that lots of wealth, you know, the, the prevailing narrative is there's lots of wealth to be had from the ocean, but we're not making progress because of lack of investment unsustainable operating practices, inadequate governance, and so on. And I'm not saying that those, those aren't important discussions to have, but there are other narratives too. And so um, today I want to share with you some case studies of leadership in the blue economy, and specifically African leadership that is setting a tone that can permeate African endeavors for sustainable development for their ocean space. So the first area of leadership I want to highlight, and, and our previous minister has touched on this, uh, previous speaker sorry, has, has touched on this already, is the African Blue Economy Strategy that was launched by the African Union um, at the beginning of 2020. Um, it's the first continental scale blue economy strategy. And that's phenomenal. So again, Africa really showing a realization that the blue economy is not something we can take nationally or, or in small regions, but, but there's a continental scale approach to this because there's one ocean that unites us all. Um, in, in that it highlights that uh, the ocean economy in Africa um, is um, currently already worth $296 billion a year, and that's set to double by 2063. Um, it currently supports 49 million jobs. And again, that's due to increase to 80 million by 2063. So the key question is how to get there sustainably. And I think one of the, the difficulties we have when thinking about the blue economy is it's often presented as a thing that this is a sector or this is um, a block. I think the best way to think about the blue economy is as a process or a transition. And so when we think about the blue economy, we can think about and, and, and making the ocean economy more sustainable or bluing the ocean economy. So, so how are we able to, to blue the ocean economy? In, in the Commonwealth, um, we have um, 54 countries of which 47 uh, of coastal states. We have 12 countries in Africa. Um, and in 2018, all Commonwealth um, heads of government agreed to um, a multilateral agreement on the ocean called the Commonwealth Blue Charter, which is an agreement to cooperate on ocean action. Um, the way that's being taken forward is through action groups. There are 10 action groups uh, championed by 16 countries and 46 member countries have joined one or more of those action groups. 
Three of those champion countries are within Africa. Seychelles uh, for marine protected areas, Kenya for the sustainable blue economy, and Mauritius for coral reef protection and restoration. So again, this is we're seeing African leadership at the international scale around taking these initiatives forward. Um, if I just zoom into this box um, on the side here, you'll see what those 10 action groups are and the 16 champion countries, but I'm not gonna dwell on that today. What I'd like to do is talk about these case studies and I'm putting this slide up because the Seychelles is my favorite case study, um, having worked on, on the uh, Blue Economy Roadmap um, with, with Seychelles. And um, we, we've done a, a couple of case studies that I'm, I'm highlighting that are available on our website around the marine spatial planning and the blue finance um, approaches that Seychelles have taken. But since the minister has spoken about these so eloquently already, I'm not going to go into those now. Instead, I'm going to jump to a case study um, from South Africa called Ocean Women. A sustainable blue economy needs firstly to be science-based because it's needed to underpin the evidence base for policy and decision making. Secondly, it needs to improve equity for communities within the ocean economy. And this next case study addresses both of these challenges. Um, the sort of national demographic of South Africa based on the 2011 census showed that 76% of the population was black. And the University of Cape Town did its own audit in 2018 and found that 31% of professors were women. Uh, so there were 76 women professors there, but only 15 of these were black South Africans. Um, the Department of Oceanography um, looked at its, all its postgraduate students, 73 postgraduate students. Only 12 of these were black women and there were no black women in the faculty. So, so the, the, the difference to the national demographic was stark and um, there was a realization of the need for action. So in 2018, the vice chancellor launched the Advancing Women Initiative and that supports this Ocean Women project. And it's actually championed by the office of the vice chancellor and, and funded through the university. And, and the program has three aims. Firstly, to develop a prestigious research and leadership program for black women that recruits, retains and enables success for the next gen generation of black women oceanographers. Secondly, to identify and overcome barriers by creating an environment that allows black women to succeed and become leaders. And thirdly, to determine if the ocean women model could be applied more broadly in other ocean science programs in South Africa or to other ocean, oceanography programs beyond South Africa. It takes a really holistic approach. Ocean Women offers the fellows tailored support in these three areas, financial, professional, and personal. So taking a holistic view of the barriers for black women in science. And so the inaugural cohort of five black women, uh, the fellows, entered the program in 2020, and two more joined in 2021. And um, it, it's really moving towards its goal of creating a generation of black women leaders in oceanography who become role models and mentors for future generations. Um, it's an evolving program that offers formalized mentorship opportunities, connects fellows with, with black women mentors in other sciences, um, and um, th these fellows have begun seeking out the mentors um, to participate in the program. So it's, it's a, a really you know, excellent example of how equity is being dealt with in the African blue economy and, and a great example of leadership. The next case study gets far more technical. Um, and this is um, one that shows coastal, that, that from, um, well, the Western Indian Ocean region, um, Madagascar, Mauritius, Mozambique, and South Africa. And it's um, a coastal risk information service. One of the key areas where ocean science and data are needed to support a sustainable blue economy is in addressing climate risks. Coastal communities are exposed to an increase in the frequency and intensity of weather-related phenomena, such as sea surges, cyclones, and flooding, and due to climate change generally. The coastal populations of Southwest 
Indian Ocean nations are increasingly vulnerable to the effects of such extreme weather events. In particular, there are climate sensitive, economically important coastal resources, such as port and aquaculture infrastructures, as well as ecologically important habitats that are exposed to the sea surges associated with ever more frequent and forceful cyclones. The predictability of such events can be improved with knowledge gained from the acquisition and analysis of satellite drive data on ocean and atmospheric variables. But access to regional data on coastal risk factors um, can be a major barrier. Um, so so um, as can the skills to, to develop this. And so the Sea Rise project has sought to improve the situation by offering training opportunities to coastal management practitioners in Southern Africa through courses on how to acquire necessary open access data sets, which are hosted by South Africa, and, and along with license free software, and to train them on how to apply such data sets and analytical skills to resolve the specific challenges uh, they focused on. There were 27 real world case studies in the coastal settings of Mozambique and Madagascar that were focused on by the project. Um, so um, it was funded by the UK Space Agency between 2016 and 2019. And it's really delivered on its three objectives, uh, delivering a coastal risk information service, providing satellite derived information about sea levels, wind and waves to support coastal vulnerability assessment and hazard management efforts. It's applied and evaluated the sea rise service through the application of its products to selected real world scenarios that address local priorities. And it's built local capacity to use satellite data to provide scientific decision support for strategy development, governance and management of coastal areas to increase res resilience to coastal hazards. And, and, and the impact of this is already be, being demonstrated. Um, for example, it's uh, enabled law enforcement in cases of drug trafficking and illegal migration, improved management of mangroves and reefs, and improved the management of marine protected areas. Um, so um, again, real case study of, of how um, Africa is taking a lead in the technology needed to support um, a sustainable blue economy. The third case study I want to share is uh, one of the most innovative developments in the blue economy, which is around blue carbon. Um, blue carbon are essentially investments in coastal habitats that are particularly efficient at sequestering carbon dioxide and then selling these as carbon credits um, on the inter international voluntary carbon markets. The Tahiri Hongko Mangrove Carbon Project was one of the first in the world to demonstrate how community-based blue carbon projects can work. Essentially, the project is helping build community resilience and provides a model to help tackle climate breakdown by restoring and protecting mangrove forests. Mangroves underpin coastal fisheries and provide vital sources of fuel, wood and timber, um, protect coastal people from extreme weather and act as a key natural climate solution by sequestering globally significant amounts of carbon dioxide. Despite their huge value, mangroves are being deforested at an alarming rate. Unbaited mangrove destruction will deprive tens of millions of people of their livelihoods and undermine their well-being. It will exacerbate the global climate emergency we now face while taking away what vital natural protection coastal people have against it. So working in partnership with Blue Ventures, 10 villages within the Valondriak uh, locally managed marine area in Southwest Madagascar are employing a participatory monitoring and management approach as a solution to address degradation and deforestation of mangroves. By verifying the success of this management and monitoring under the Plan Vivo standard, this approach generates carbon credits whose sale can in turn provide sustainable income to both the project villages and the Volondriac Management Association. The project promotes locally led conservation, reforestation and sustainable use of over 1200 hectares of mangroves alongside initiatives that build alternative livelihoods, including sea cucumber and seaweed farming and mangrove beekeeping. And they support the delivery of health and education services in the region as well by avoiding emissions of over 1300 tons of CO2 per year. 
The Hiri Honko will provide a regular income through carbon credit sales to support local management of the marine protected area over the next 20 years. And funds will also help finance community development, including the construction of vital infrastructure and supporting healthcare and education. So um, I hope uh, these case studies um, have really shown you how um, there's a different narrative about the blue economy in Africa that we can tell as well, about how African countries are really showing leadership in developing a sustainable blue economy. I just wanted to finish with this last slide, which um, is one of my favorite projections of the world. Um, it shows it as one ocean. It's an ocean-centric view. It's called the Spillhouse Projection. It reminds me of Pablo Neruda's line, um, the piece of the sand that encircles the world. We see Africa right in the heart of this map. And it shows how Africa's blue economy is connected to the rest of the world through this one ocean. And so cooperation regionally within Africa and beyond Africa is absolutely essential for delivering a sustainable blue economy. So on that note, I just thank you and um, bring greetings from all those um, across the Commonwealth. Nick, thank you very, very much for a very um, insightful and uh, illuminating list of case studies, which I think help us uh, give ammunition to the folks who are arguing for the positive changes against the pessimists out there who seem to think this is hopeless. While the challenges are great, uh, you mentioned a number of important success stories. And I was also struck by your mentioning of the, uh, the equity uh, story in, in South Africa, because I, sometimes this has not been given as much uh, I think, emphasis as it, as it should have been for sure. So I appreciate the uh, range of case studies you provided for us, and also your general philosophy about the importance of collaboration and regional cooperation. Before we get to the 20 or 30 questions I've seen in my uh, question box, I do have a question related to this. It's a bit on the technical side, but it has political implications for the region. Let me just ask um, anyone, perhaps Nick, I could ask you first, but then anyone else that wants to start. You know, the Africa's uh, integrated maritime strategy that's been referenced two or three times this afternoon, the Africa's integrated maritime strategy by the African Union, calls for a combined exclusive maritime zone for Africa, a combined exclusive maritime zone for Africa. Again, I don't want to get too technical about, the, about this, but as a philosophical or a political statement, is that realistic in the near future? And, and is it necessary? Question to any panel members. I think I'll start with Nick though. <laughs> yeah, well, so um, obviously this is a political question for African um, regionalization and um, to what extent um, do African nations want more than um, economic union um, that is achieved through the African continental free trade area? Um, but also, is there an opportunity th through the African continental free trade area to explore some elements of uh, greater elements of transboundary cooperation within their existing EEZs at the moment, um, particularly in relation to trade? So, so I think it's an evolving story, you know, um, where Africa goes on, on, on political union in the future, just as it, with Europe or, or with the Caribbean or, or with the Pacific. You know, it is, is um, an ongoing discussion, um, and but but I think the the opportunity of the African continental free trade area does provide opportunities for some level of greater cooperation around use of those exclusive economic zones. Could, could I ask Dr. Uh, Minister Ferrari to, to comment on this? Since he might be facing this very issue right now, I'm not sure. But what would you say about the idea of a? Um, combined exclusive economic zones. I know you've been working with Mauritius along those lines in a way, but how much further can, can we go? Uh, sir, sir, you're muted. Uh, thank you, I must say I haven't given much, uh, much thought to, uh, to that, uh, to that extent, because what, what you, what you're suggesting is, is huge. But what I'd like to say is that uh, regional cooperation is where we should start. 
and uh, and uh, we uh, we in the Indian Ocean and uh, and uh, the presentation that we just saw has uh, shown us how uh, when we cooperate regionally we can do great things, and uh, so I I believe that uh, we should start at that level in. Uh, uh, um, uh, the uh, the example that I gave earlier that you you know uh, about is the the joint management uh, of the Sahara de Mala Plateau with between Seychelles and Mauritius. It's a very very exciting uh, project, and uh, and uh, and uh, we all uh, want to see uh, it replicated in other parts of the world. But it starts at that level, one plus one. I think uh, I think. Uh, we should uh, Africa is so diverse at the moment that uh, we 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 should be looking at commonalities and uh, and uh, things that 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 uh, unite us across the region. Another example is uh, is uh, fisheries management. Uh, we uh, it's it's absolutely uh, essential that we that we uh, get this right because it is it is a very important resource in the blue economy that is. And a serious threat, and I can tell you um, uh, uh, already in the Indian Ocean, uh, in the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission, we are having some some real difficulties trying to to align our position. So, so uh, the the, wide, the the larger the group, the more difficult it it, it it becomes. So I'd like to say my my vision is for is for unity across the across the regions and sub regions. Uh, as a first step towards uh, towards having uh, having a more uh, open uh, open uh, and, and and wider groupings uh, uh, across the continent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Larose or uh, Francis. Any comments on this idea of how to strengthen cooperation, either continental wide or sub regionally? Uh, Don, I will listen carefully to the questions. And of course, as uh, Honorable Minister uh, Ferrari mentioned, we need to start somewhere. And uh, special uh, recognition must go to uh, uh, a strategic uh, approach towards a special uh, blend of uh, policies that will uh, showcase us to a, a much uh, grander uh, efforts to achieve uh, collective um certainly uh, the the point of uh, being uh, joined together we, we cannot join together in a big way we would be like europe we lost uh, with this uh, european exchange rate you know but in the end uh, this is suffice um, experience to lead us to uh, say hang on we cannot start big and then end small that's my view Thank you very much. Francis, any comments for you? Oh, Frank, you're muted. Francis, are you having audio issues or you're unmuted? Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um... That's yes, true, uh, Chipwin and Ed um, has been said so far. Um, I mentioned in my presentation that uh, uh, Africa is endowed with uh, uh, a lot of marine resources. Um, just to take example of uh, Tanzania, as I alluded, we have a stretch of uh, over 1,400 uh, kilometers along and uh, a lot of unexploited resources. The natural gas uh, that has been uh, um, uh, found in uh, the southern part of Tanzania uh, is there, but we cannot uh, exploit that resources uh, in isolation. Uh, due to the technical capacity, um, we need uh, the human resource capacity with the knowledge. We need uh, the skills which are built in, in that industry. But we need also the finance, we need the infrastructure to be developed. So that cannot happen uh, in isolation, as I say. In the era that the member countries uh, can utilize the existing uh, framework 
and that is guided by the African Union Blue Economy Strategy. And that I think that's where we start because we have already the, 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 the policy framework. And uh, since uh, the, uh, the African member countries that are signed to the African Union, that is a platform for the buy-in. There is a buy-in, but we need to implement it, put it into practice, but also monitor this place as each of these country uh, have signed to that uh, uh, platform. So I think uh, the cooperation that we are looking for is uh, to see the aim of the African you know, Blue Economy strategy. And no one should be left behind. Each of the three should go along this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, a number of questions have come in regarding the importance of local buy-in. It's been mentioned a few times, but a few uh, comments have suggested that local uh, efforts have been perhaps ignored by Western-minded organizations. And one from, uh, that just came in says, I'll read it for you. Historically, when collaborating with international and regional governments to create policy about the blue economy, indigenous knowledge has been neglected. For example, when looking at the creation of the fisheries policy in Tanzania, the creation of Mafia Island Marine Park, Mombasa Marine Park. How did the panel members suggest to prevent this from future collaborative endeavors? In other words, how can more indigenous and local knowledge and expertise be employed for uh, moving the blue economy agenda forward? I ask anyone to uh, comment, please. Uh, Don, I would like to participate in this question. Hello? Please, please. We are all Africans. So therefore we have to believe in African model. It's our model and we uh, promote it because if our own Africans tries to promote a model and then he doesn't get the support, at the end of the day, what do we expect from him? Uh, which means that uh, it's death at birth. You know, we need uh, certainly to change our mindset vis-a-vis -vis our development, vis-a-vis -vis our unity, vis-a-vis -vis our collaboration, and uh, with re regards to uh, generating maximum uh, return. We cannot generate maximum return if there's no effort. I repeat, we cannot generate maximum re return without effort. We need the special effort, work hard, and then the benefits uh, comes later. Uh, no gain, no pain. I certainly agree. Um, if, if I could just add, Donald, um, I, th I think you know the, the the need for for proper stakeholder engagement in any blue economy project is absolutely critical. I mean, I, I think too often it's an afterthought um, when actual fact it should probably be, be the bulk of the work is stakeholder engagement um, in terms of really making sure that all communities are, are consulted, uh, all views are taken onto account. Indigenous and traditional knowledge is an absolutely critical source of, of um, data and, and insight into local systems, local communities, local ways of livelihood, um, and the natural environment, the way it works in, in ways that, that science hasn't mapped out yet often. Um, I remember um, sort of standing in Western Australia talking to one of the traditional owners um, looking out over the sea and he was telling me from oral knowledge where the, the, the freshwater springs used to be under that sea 7,000 years ago um, before, the, before the sea levels rose. Um, th that is phenomenal knowledge if we can tap it. And so, you know, really sort of in making sure that, that, that um, in Africa and elsewhere, you know, that, that um, all stakeholders are, are properly engaged and that particularly we pay attention to indigenous and traditional knowledge systems and, and, and owners, um, then I, I, th I think, you know, that, that will provide a real, really good underpinning for any um, sustainable development that follows from that. And, and related related comment uh, suggested that there hasn't been enough to engage harness youth involvement in pushing the blue economy agenda forward. 
are we guilty of this? Are we guilty of not engaging the youth um, in, in Africa to the extent we need to? I know, uh, I know. Can I come in? Sure, yes, please, thank you. Yes, um, I thank you again. Uh, you alluded to um, the uh, Blue Zanzibar and, and uh, how the indigenous uh, knowledge can uh, possibly be used and uh, benefited to this. For the implementation, which I think there is uh, an unexploited uh, potential, unleashed potential for uh, socio-economic development uh, in uh, Africa. Um, that policy has put or highlights on the government buy-in to develop the economies using the, uh, the available uh, marine resources. Uh, that policy should be inclusive. That policy gives us the sense that uh, uh, all these initiatives should be inclusive enough so that no one is left behind this. Uh, before uh, the sophisticated uh, uh, blue economy comes in, the indigenous people have been uh, using the marine resources for their uh, like, I mean, livelihood. Uh, nevertheless, uh, their poverty levels haven't been uh, improved because of the low technology of exploiting uh, the marine resources, the fisheries. They've been using low fishing equipment, uh, low technologies, but they have the indigenous skills, which needs now to be developed from where they are. We only need to improve where they have been traditionally been working on. And largely we could see that the women engaging in uh, um, the uh, fisheries uh, uh, project. They have uh, been part of it. They don't go into fishing, but they, you see them in the value chain where you see them in the market. You see them uh, processing um, the fishes that comes on. So as we adopt this, the sophisticated in fishing industries that would come to process, they should include women so it should include uh it should be inclusive enough including women and youth why without disregarding their local knowledge that we develop the existing knowledge to modernize it thank you, if, thank you. If, can i can i say something please yes i i'd like to say stakeholder engagement is is absolutely critical and uh, for the youth of course but for the for the the uh, coastal communities and all, all of those who will be involved in the blue economy. You see, uh, uh, one thing that you have to accept is that there is still a lot of suspicion vis-a-vis -a, -vis a discourse or narrative that comes from the, from the, the rich world to the poor world. There's a lot of suspicion. And, uh, and uh, people uh, in my country, people view, view, view this with, uh, with skepticism. And we, a, a lot of the effort is, is made into convincing them that the project is a good one, despite the fact that it is being promoted by, by those guys, excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, by those guys who messed up our environment. Mm -hmm. So a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of the effort is, is there, but it works. It works if we put the, the effort and we engage them. Let me tell you of a, of a fantastic story that uh, unfolded this this week in uh, in, in Seychelles, we uh, we we celebrated the the end of a project where the fishermen on the second island of uh, of Prale, on their own, put up a project, raised the finance, and closed the fishery for six months, and for for three consecutive years because they wanted to, they believed that by regulating and managing the fishery, it can work and it did work. There's more fish, there's larger fish. It, it's a fantastic story done by the people themselves without any any involvement of, of the, 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 the government authorities 
except for the fact that the government authorities said, you may go ahead, go ahead with it and, uh, and, uh, and get it done. So there are things, there are beautiful stories that are happening uh, around, uh, around our countries, but most of them are uh, bottom up, uh, are stakeholder driven and, and, and involve, involve the stakeholders. Yeah, the, later on this uh, this year, in October and November, we've just uh, concluded uh, uh, the the organization of uh, a research uh, a research uh, a scientific research project that is funded by the Monaco uh, Foundation, uh, Prince Albert Foundation, that will that, that will that will do uh, research work in Mauritius, Seychelles, Saadimala, and back to Mauritius. We have. We have 15 young scientists on board that vessel, 15. And they are all excited and all eager to go in and do something because we have involved the stakeholders and we don't do that enough. So, so I, as I thank you for your interest, I thank you for your, and, and, I, and I'm sure that you, you do it with all your heart. Don't forget to involve the, uh, the, the, the local communities because they are the ones the, the, they are the other ones who's, who, 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 who need to be part of the success if the success is going to be sustainable in time. Otherwise, it, it won't work. This, the last thing I like to say on stakeholder uh, involvement is be careful also when, uh, when uh, you come up with, uh, with uh, no tech zones saying, in this area, we won't do anything. We just conserve and preserve, very suspicious. People want to continue earning their, their livelihood. Even if it's in a national park, in a marine park, people want to do it. People want to earn their, 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 their livelihood. And whether we change a little bit and move from fishing to tourism, it must never be a no-take zone. It must never be a fully no-go uh, no area. It just doesn't work. People turn into into poachers, and we lose the the uh, the, the 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 whole uh, uh, the, the whole uh, the whole success is lost because of uh, of the suspicion. So, I hope you understand what I've been trying to say. We we, we just need to be careful with the way we approach. Uh, we we engage the, the the local stakeholders, but we need to be careful in the way we approach them. Thank you. Thank you. I take I, I take with note uh, your point about suspicion. Uh, thank you for those comments. Uh, we are almost out of time, but I want to present one last question from me to the four of you. And I want to ask you please to limit your question, uh, your answer to, to a minute or less. And it's a bit off topic in a way, but we've been talking about the need for cooperation and uh, collaboration. We haven't talked yet about at all about, and it's rarely talked about in forums like this, the hinterland states, the landlocked states, and what's in it for them. So. If you were a, um, a policymaker in, in Iswatini, where I lived for a year, your landlord, what, what's in it for you? Why is it important? Why is the blue economy in Africa important even for you who are tens or hundreds of miles inland? So a minute or less from each of you, please. Yeah. It's a challenging question. Well, because the blue economy is, is also rivers and lakes. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and from the rivers and the lakes, there, there are great, source, great resources. We need uh, we need to to engage the the, the stakeholders at, at, at that level because not only is there a message for them to take care of of of, uh, of those uh, water basins, it also tells us that if you mess up uphill, you're going to pick up the consequences downhill, yeah. and this this is absolutely absolutely critical. We've seen that. I mean, look, look at uh, you, those of you who know Madagascar well. Look at the uh, look, look. Look at the color of the sea around Madagascar. It's 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 all it's it's all because those upstream have been messing up and uh, and uh, have been cutting down the forests. And now, the 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 blue. It's no longer a blue uh, a blue economy. Uh, I shouldn't be laughing. But it's no longer a blue economy. It's it's more a a, a red economy because. Uh, of the, the of the 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 the, the change of color of uh, of the sea because of deforestation and uh, and uh, soil erosion. So um, uh, the 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 blue economy is, is not just 
the sea. It's everything that leads to the sea. And, uh, and even in small countries like uh, in small island states like Seychelles, we need to, we, we need to, to, be, to keep educating our, our, our citizens to, to the protection of the, of the watersheds of, uh, of, of the, the hillsides. It's one world. It's one world. It's, it's one ocean, of course, but it's one world, and 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 uh, all those bits are interconnected. So uh, I'm I'm becoming a little bit philosophical now. I uh, but uh, but I really feel that the message should be should be should be a wide one. Should be we, we can't do it on our own. It, it's not the coast the coastal populations that are that are the only ones responsible for the protection of the coastal environment. It's it's every one of us. It's every one of us. It's uh, and it's. And it's also the, uh, the, 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 the person from, uh, from Switzerland, the, the, the tourist from Switzerland that comes to Seychelles, or the tourist from Luxembourg, which, which are uh, landlocked countries, to understand the dynamics of the, uh, of the ocean. And finally, finally, the, the, uh, the, the climate change. Is, 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 uh, often we forget that uh, it's in the ocean that, that we feel that we feel the, the the greatest impact nowadays. It's it's it, it, it's not it's not it's not uh, climate in terms of of just uh, of just uh, global warming. It's it's the effect that it has on the, on the ocean. So so it's one world, and that's why that, that, that's how I would answer your question. We need to we need to, uh, like a jigsaw. All the pieces need to fit in together. Thank you very much. I certainly agree with this. Uh, anyone else want to uh, have a brief, brief? Yeah. Thanks, Donald. Um, the I, I absolutely agree with with your, your comments, Minister. That, that those are really critical sort of areas where where the the you know the boundary between land and sea, you know, it's it, it, it's porous, and and what happens on, on one side of the boundary really affects the other. Um, and this integration of ocean, atmosphere, and land, you know, through the climate system, that's absolutely critical. One other thing I would add to that is um, the law of the sea. The UN Convention on the Law of the Sea um, re recognizes the need of um, landlocked states for access to the ocean. Um, and so, you know, that, that because because more than eighty percent of, of global trade goes goes by sea. You know, so 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 everybody needs sort of that access to the ocean and is reliant on the ocean to some degree. And and so we see things that, so, such as sort of the the cooperation between Botswana and Namibia about, you know, in, ensuring that um, you know that there is that access to the ocean and 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 and. Uh, blue corridors and, and a, a, you know, ability to engage in the blue economy for landlocked states, and 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 so so you know it, it's there in international law. Um, we need to to work towards achieving that. Thank you, Nick. Thanks very much. We're running quickly out of time. I want to apologize for the participants who uh, whose questions we haven't had a chance to get to. We've had about I think thirty or forty questions, so uh, I'm sorry for that. I did want to turn it back over to Elisa now to see if uh, any other panel members have some closing thoughts before you end up in about five minutes. Thank you very much, um, Donald. And thank you everyone for what was a very exhilarating uh, discussion. Um, I, I was particularly struck by how we were reminded, if you want, of the core importance of the blue economy for all of humanity and the core role that Africa plays in this context and the interconnected nature of our one blue planet. Um, and I think in that context, I was also reminded of the core importance of financing in supporting this uh, crucial resource for uh, all of us and, uh, and the need for coordination across various agencies, across different levels of state, from the local to the national, to the regional and the international. And in particular, the core importance of concessional finance to support what is a core resource for all of us and not only for those local communities immediately affected by the very fast degradation of our uh, blue planet. So, so I, I want to thank the panel members for their emphasis on these various interconnections for, and the, the way in which we had a um, continuous emphasis on the important articulations between the local, the national, the regional, and the international, as well as the articulations, not just across different levels of state, 
but also across different levels or spheres of the economy. So it is not just about what we understand to be the blue economy, but this articulates very crucially with other parts of the economies, whether we're talking tourism, uh, whether we're talking transport, whether we're talking industries, whether we're talking natural gas, et cetera. So, so I think, yes, um, we had a, some closing comments that, that again, draw it back to, you know, this is very important. Um, and in that importance, we need those bottom-up approaches to inform what we do and while we do so, let's not forget that what happens in these bottom-up approaches is going to be mattering for all of us, even if we may consider ourselves very far away, for instance, from the Seychellian uh, uh, waters. So, so I think it was uh, wonderful uh, in the way in which it allowed at least me to reflect on those various interconnections and articulations uh, across and just to, to remind me and perhaps hopefully everyone else of, of really the core, what is at stake and that it is really uh, upon all of us to advocate for mobilization of resource for the issues uh, to be addressed with, with massive urgency. So that's uh, for me, I want to thank everyone uh, for their um, a tremendous participation and contributions here. And I'll quickly hand over to my co-hosts if they want to add a few closing comments. Uh, so perhaps, sorry. Yeah. Thank you, Elisa. Sorry, if I jump in very quickly. Um, I agree with all you said. I was particularly struck by uh, some of the uh, evidence that uh, both Mr. Ferrari and uh, Nick uh, Hardman mountford demonstrated. Uh, policies are fine, policies are necessary, but policies are not sufficient. And it is the kind of practical example uh, of how you can go about protecting these marine protected areas. What are the mechanisms? What are the resources that you need to do it? And the specific projects that Nick highlighted, um, specific examples of action in practice, including local with local communities. That's what carried weight. And I think it's very important that we can see these things can be done and to demonstrate how uh, you can go about it. There are models, there is best practice to follow and we need to consolidate that. And in somewhere like Tanzania, uh, we need to get these practical implementations uh, in place. And that applies across the whole of the uh, coastal Africa. But that was really uh, very illuminating and I think highlighted the uh, imperative need to press ahead with this practical implementation. Thanks to everybody involved, uh, particularly Donald, whose inspiration this was uh, to hold this and whose uh, book underpins a lot of the research that you've been hearing about. Uh, and uh, without your efforts, Donald, uh, this would not have taken place and the blue economy would not be as on the agenda as I hope it now is. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Nick. Yeah, maybe if I could take this opportunity to give uh, a quick um, um, uh, last word. And I think uh, Elisa and, uh, and uh, Nick have uh, summarized very well, but just one sentence I'd like to add is that basically the financing of the blue economy has come up as a very important dimension that needs to look at both from the government side, from the governments, from the private sector, from you know donors. I think actually, the recent developments in financial technologies and fintech uh, provide some way forward. And I think we researchers should just uh, get extremely busy and look at how a, a financing, innovative financing can be used to support this sector. I know that uh, Peter rolled it off by starting the, um, the blue bond, but now financial technologies have made it quite possible actually to have different permutations and to involve different uh, stakeholders uh, to get financing make, made much more easier. And we shall be looking into that very well. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, for me, it's been, it's definitely a great opportunity for Barry to have been co-hosting this event. So thank you to the other co-hosts. Um, it's clear that um, we can improve alliances and collaborations across the continent and in this way purposefully advance our sustainable development through knowledge sharing, transformative leadership and partnerships among other men. And I personally wish to thank the Honorable Minister Jean-François Ferrari for supporting the work of Barry and the University and for accepting to participate today. 
Also, thank you to Dr. Peter LaRose. Um, to me as a social war, the presence of those two people speaks on the enthusiasm, the support and the buy-in of the policy and decision makers and how collaboration across disciplines and expertise is so invaluable. I also want to thank the other members of the panel, so Dr. Nicholas and Professor Francis, thank you. Um, Barry is encouraged by the presentations here and we look forward to future engagements as we continue to define avenues for better collaboration. So thank you very much. Thank you, Silvana. Thank you. Thank very you. Much. I appreciate it very much. Uh, yeah, thank you, Silvana. Thank you, um, all our hosts. It's been a real pleasure. And can I then perhaps close with a final thanks to Donald Sparks, who has been the uh, the, the person who drew, allowed this to be possible and who very skillfully moderated the entire uh, session. Thanks it, again, Donald. It was, it was, thank you. It was an entire pleasure working with everyone here. It was a, 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 I'm very grateful for your, for, your, for your help. It was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.